Hello. So. Right. I've just finished using this to record a video with Jamie from Armored Carriers, which is the, the, uh, the discussion we've all been wanting for uh, to come on Carriers. So it's now recorded. I've done my edit and it's gone to him to add in some video stuff. So should be quite cool when it comes through. So I thought as I had everything set up and I could now use my phone to do some recording because it does seem to be the better camera. I'm going to work on that thing. Um, I would use my time productively and record some the landing craft. Well, before taking the doggy for a walk. So, I hope you enjoy. Let's do this slightly up. So, today it's headquarters ships group uh, group four and group five the miscellaneous. And I quite simply have HMS Bololo there. The most successful of the headquarters ships and by and far away the only one which was really worth the money. Now, the elves were all quite useful, but they just weren't used as much as her. So. Now, I should have had it up for about 20 seconds, and in an unusual break from normality, it will be up for another 10 seconds before the next slide pops up. Because it's quite a crowded slide. It has to be because I need these ships to be compared next to each other. But normally, if I had this much information, I'd have broken up into two slides, but they need to be compared next to each other. So, single slide route. And as you can see, you've got Lothian down the bottom, which is um, hmm, not very good. The first arm, managed to have an armed mutiny, I think about the first in 150 years, and the most serious one since the Ian Gordon mutiny in the 1930s, which had been very much not armed. Um, the ship wasn't really designed for the Far East, and it was always a sweat box. But they were going with what they had available, and that's what they had to do with it. You know, from a headquarters ship is everything slammed into it. So it's got huge map tables, it has radars, it has radios. It is a command center. It is a floating Cheyenne Mountain complex for those who are American, for those who are British. Northward. That's the closest we have to this day of what they were literally doing. Some people would probably use Albion and Bulwark, which are our landing, the British landing platform docks. But honestly, those ships, whilst they're excellently fitted out for amphibious operations and for command and control of even up to a task force level, and they do have all sorts of wonderful gear, and I'm saying the Queen Elizabeth class, they have wonderful gear in their command rooms for Commodores, Admirals to make decisions and command things. We're talking a level beyond that in equivalent period. These ships were colossal spaces. They had staff from the Air Force, from the Army, from the Navy, from every single branch, and intelligence services, foreign office, lawyers, the lot were included. Everything that needed to be there was there. Multiple nationalities. There is a reason why Bololo is so appropriate as the point that the Japanese surrender on the ship that except the ship they go and have this uh, they accept the surrender on is bololo in singapore because she was the ship which was going to be the linchpin the if you're to honor talking about a helicopter the jesus nut that's the bolt which holds on the main rotor onto the air onto the helicopter Basically, the idea is if it goes, you don't even see St. Peter, you blast straight through the pearly gates and meet at the feet, are at the feet of Jesus. So, they are the Jesus nut of the operation. 
Without them, nothing else works because they are there to bring it all together. And really, they are critical. You know, Bololo does Operation Torch, Operation Husky, Operation Shingle, Operation Neptune, slash over what is sometimes broadly speaking as Overlord, but Neptune is the naval part of it. And then she's the flagship for Force W off Malaya. She's there. Atrus Largs was originally a French banana ship. Took part in Operation Torch. And was the headquarters ship for Saw Beach. Ended the war in the Pacific, commanding operations off Thailand and Malaya. Yeah. Um, she was the other tar she was the other ship out with force uh, with um, Bololo. And HMS Hillary. Interesting one. Starts out as being used by Commodore Oliver at D Day and then gets taken over by Admiral Vian when Scylla gets knocked out. <laughs> it's fun times. And then you find it's kind of interesting because you look through and HMS Scylla really isn't what should have been being used. But, you know, it was where Vian was sent. And then via, well, of course, being on a cruiser does make sense. But, you know. Fun times had by all. But these weren't the only large ships. These weren't the only communication ships, even. Or the only headquarters ships. Landing Ship Headquarters Frigate, LSHF. To be honest, I've given them that designation. I found about four or five different letter acronyms in the various books I was reading. The, the most common ones seem fairly much to appropriate that, so I use that. They could also be Landing Ship Headquarters Small, but I preferred Landing Ship Headquarters Frigate, because they are! The Royal Navy takes three of the US-built Captain-class frigates, and converts them ahead of normally landings by taking off their aft gun and depth charges and adding a superstructure and adding more 20 millimeter cannon. I can't think why when they're doing D-Day. And they use them. So you've got Dyker, you've got Kingsford, uh, uh, Kingsmill and Lang Lawsford. I often think Kingsmill should be known as HMS Bread, but that's me making a bad joke. So, Dyker takes part in Operation Neptune with a flooded forward engine room and is afterwards returned to normal frigate configuration. The thing was, her forward engine might be out, but she could still make fast enough to lead a convoy of amphibious ships, so she was fine. You know, you you have this scenario again. It's it's the Royal Navy scenario. It works. It's still fine. Let's go with it. Um, HMS Lawford was actually sunk, either by an early guided missile, probably an AHS two nine three, or an aerial torpedo. Now, interesting enough, <laughs> and here's the joke. Okay, so the idea is that the aerial torpedo that is the Royal Navy's description of the early missiles, which it could be, but remember, the Royal Navy has been facing missiles in the Mediterranean. It has been facing these early attempts at a, you know, guided munition, well, not guided, but let's say propelled munition, um, used by the um, Germans previously. So I'm not sure why they'd be referring them to them as aerial torpedoes. But I haven't been able to make the National Archives to check, so... I have watched the episode on cha of the Channel 4 um, Wreck Detectives, and I, after seeing that online, and after seeing various other things mentioning it, so I have done that, 
and that's what they're saying. So apparently the Royal Navy writes them up these missiles as aerial torpedoes. I don't think so, but you know, hey ho. It, it seems a bit strange, but it could well be the case. But HMS Lawford is sunk by one, which shows another reason why the little frigates at this time are really not good ships to be on. One hit, gone. Oh, good. Fighter Direction Tenders. These are converted LSTs, but they're LST Mark IIs converted. Um, and basically... So... It's chain home taken to the Normandy be uh, beaches. It's the idea that you can, you've can you got to control a huge number of land-based fighters. Remember, they're not bringing the carriers into Normandy. There is a sensible reason not to bring the carriers into Normandy. Why would you bring the carriers in when you have that much access to land-based fighters within range? Why would you risk your carriers? Even the Brits aren't silly enough to do that. Or, you know... You know, you have other things you can be using your carriers for, which are far useful. But you need to replicate the commander control facilities you have on your carriers for aircraft direction. And yes, you have some AA cruisers. Well, hey. But AA cruisers don't have the same facilities as a carrier does. And they certainly don't have the Even a carrier might not. The carriers wouldn't have necessarily enough of them. A facilities to direct the entire sheer quantity of aircraft you're going to be dealing with. <laughs> Meet the fighter direction tender. And they're effective. Oh, and by the way, that radar on the front. <laughs> it's German, free, based on German free, uh, studies of German frequencies, because the idea was that the Germans would try and ban, uh, well, try and, uh, not ban, uh, Germans would try and um, jam, sorry, brain dead then, uh, uh, would try and jam allied frequencies. So if you were operating German frequency radars, uh, then they wouldn't jam you. <laughs> <laughs> ah. I know it's a it's a cruel move. It's a really cruel move. But one interesting thing is you have these three, but the Royal Navy goes, oh, we can do better than this. So these are three converted LST Mark Twos. Meet the fighter direction ships, or ship rather, because I've only really found one, but please, that I think there might be more to planned. Atris Boxer was converted from an LST-1 to an FDS, which was an FTT on steroids is what I've written there, and it's great. Um, basically, bigger, better, she has more power generation, more space. This ship has it all crammed into her. And she really is a pretty useful ship. But what the Rono is planning on doing with her next is an interesting thing because. Okay, so these fighter direction ships, they make perfect sense for Normandy. But do they make sense for the Far East? No. The tenders quickly converted back. This one, I'm not so sure. I think she might have been kept, because they might have decided that she, she would have been useful and you could have kept the carriers back further and had her closer to the landing point, uh, landing zones, um, rather like the US Marine Corps were trying in the island hopping campaign. It might well have been the case, but this is certainly what's being looked at. But 
doesn't happen, so we don't know. What we do know is that the British were fully preparing for the Pacific. This is an example of how they were preparing for the Pacific, because the repair ships, or the landing ship engineering in British parlance, LSEs, um, basically, we found that the Yanks are building a version of the LST, the landing ship tank, of the Aculus class, which are orientated around fixing landing craft. And they're orientated for because even the Americans, with their endless run of productions and their ramped up industry, are going, ouch, this is starting to get painful. It is. We have to take them all the way back and bring them all the way forward. You know, all the way back to be repaired and all the way forward. It's, it's pointless for the little ships. Uh, but if you keep losing them, and they're, you can't treat them as expendable because they're not they're easy to get. Yes, you can replace them, but you need a lot of them. You need an awful lot, especially as they get damaged in operations quite heavily. So any you can repair and return to the front line quickly, as close to the front line as possible, really useful, like tanks. So these come up. And the British all get two, um, ARL5 and ARL6, Designated LSE-1 and LSE-2. And they were returned in May 1946. Basically, the Royal Navy didn't need them post-World War II. We're not going to be doing a massive amphibious landing that, time, that soon in the Far East, so we don't need them. In the UK, in the Northern Waters, the nice way British industry is right on top of them. Why would you do this when you can just send it quickly back there? For the Americans in the Pacific, it only matters if they're the other side of the Pacific. If they're in Europe, well, then there's Britain right there. So Britain will fix it. Um, basically, the, this only matter, these ships are only useful if you're doing a Pacific, if you're looking at Pacific operations. And this is the British really ramping up for the Pacific. And the Americans actually getting behind it. Remember what I've said in previous videos, the Americans weren't always that keen on the British getting into the Pacific in too big a way and independent operations. But... They did realise the British were going to have to do it. The British were going to have to do it because the Americans didn't want to do it all and didn't want to take all the burden themselves, especially not the invasion of Japan. That was going to be hellish. And therefore, they wanted us along. And they, for us to be along, we need to have the equipment. And we were building as much of the equipment ourselves, but if you've already got a production line building these, it's far easier for you to build two more and check my others, then ask to start up a production line and build two or three. It's going to take a lot of resources to do that, to, for us to do it, minimal resources for the Americans to do it. So it works out. Anyway, next slide. So, summary time. And this is probably going to be the shortest. I do admit, this is probably going to be the shortest of the videos. But not really. So, this is the these are the maps from the 1945 stuff produced for the Chief of Staff of the United States Army. Which explains why the European theatre has the entire Atlantic cut off and most of northern africa and most of northern europe so basically in the nicest way this should be should be at least a four thousand mile square like the other one is the pacific one is but the pacific one should probably uh, go into india and the indian ocean go a bit further south a bit further north so this should probably be about eight thousand miles across and this should be about 4,000 miles on each square uh, each outside of each square at least as it is this if done to scale with this would fit into one corner 
But anyway, that's kind of nice to illustrate the point. If you are doing amphibious operations in this region, that is your home base. The way you can refit and maintain things. If you're doing amphibious operations in this region, your nearest home base is Alaska, I think, up there. Which is really known for its heavy industry. It's known for beautiful people, a lot of beautiful scenery, wildlife, natural resources, peaceful, not a lot of heavy industry. At, definitely at this time. And therefore, your industry is back further that way. Which is why you start looking at landing ships, landing platform docks, all, all those sort of the, the sort of the landing ship docks, the, all those things start really are far more essential in this area than over here. Over here, the landing craft, most of them can actually make it from the uh, coast of the UK to the coast of the France under their own steam. Well, you prefer not to. You prefer would prefer to have them dropped off closer because, let's be honest, big waves are not good for them. But they can, in theory, do it. And if you're going in the Mediterranean, you've got a similar things going on. But if you're over here, no, it's colossal. You think about the island hopping campaign, you can't even see the islands most of the way. And if you think about going up through the Philippines, up through this direction, you've got a long way to go. It's vast distances and it changes the amphibious ships you need. So this is why there are such differences between the two sets and why the British start, you can tell when the British start thinking about going in the Pacific because they start changing the design to their building. They start orientating the designs on the construction. There's the LS, LST Mark III. That's a Pacific ship. The twos are Pacific Atlantic, good compromises. And the LST ones are far more Atlantic uh, let's put it this way, Atlantic, Indian Ocean, sort of, yeah, they're okay, but they are not really the ships you want to be going in. You're not building them enough numbers for the Pacific. And then, of course, you have all the landing craft, especially the large landing craft. Well, you know, the LCT Mark IIs and Threes, um, they are fine for the ranges in the Atlantic but you would you want them doing the ranges in the Pacific it's a question it's going to be how you're going to approach these things how are they going to be done a lot of LCT Mark V's are going to go out there on the tops of LST to Mark to LST um, no yeah LST 2's still do not like that but leaving that to one side you're going to need a lot of LSDs to get a lot of the other out of the bigger LS LCTs out to the Far East. And that's what they're starting to order. That's what we're starting to look at. So that's the difference in landing craft. Hope you've enjoyed the landing craft and the landing ships. So far, my plan is, if this is all being popular, is to at some point get into doing some videos profiling various amphibious operations, because I think that might be interesting. Now I've covered, giving you a baseline of what, are LS, what LSTs are where, what landing craft are where, and what the different types are. Neither has been exhaustive, okay? They are both produced in far too greater numbers to be exhaustive because there are little variations. There are modifications made by crew and made by different manufacturers who are producing batches. Everyone has a say in what goes on and everyone produces a slightly different thing. So yeah, this is the joy when you've got several thousand of an object entering service produced by about 30 to 40 different manufacturers, crewed by a dozen or so different nations and about twice as many services because you have some crewed by armies, some crewed by navies and some crewed by people who are something else entirely 
Um, it's a it's a fun time, and people make modifications. But if there's any specific landing craft types you would like me to do more about, please do comment below. And if I don't pay enough attention, i.e. I don't respond quickly enough, tweet at AC underscore Naval History. Normally I do pick up the comments, but I have noticed that sometimes it's easier to pick up new comments than it is comments that I've replied to. So if I reply to it and then you reply to that, sometimes it hides the comment and the reply for a couple of days from me. And then I see it and then I feel really bad about not replying sooner. So I do apologise if I haven't replied sooner. I always try to. Anyway, take care. Hope you have a nice day and hope you've enjoyed the videos on landing craft and landing ships. There'll be more amphibious warfare soon. Bye. And please do subscribe and please do tweet about these things because whilst I am now past the thousand mark and I have done the whole dancing, uh, you know, over video phone, I am rather enjoying the fact that I'm getting a lot of people to talk to. And I really enjoy the fact that there are so many people turn up to the lives and ask questions. It's, as I said, it's, I'm a naval historian, I'm a historian, I'm a university lecturer. I like teaching, I like answering questions. And I don't always know the answers, in which case I go and look them up. But, it's the little thing I can do. And so, you know, from home. So thank you. And thank you to everyone who already has subscribed. Thank you to everyone who's a patron. Thank you to everyone who asks the super chat questions. Um, those all are great and it really does help at the moment.